Today, we're making monsters, and I'm gonna show you my process for creating fun and engaging baddies for my players to fight. This video is sponsored by Describe. More on them later. Greetings gamers, I'm Anto, and I'm definitely not three cobbles in a trench coat, and making monsters is one of my favorite parts of being a dungeon master. In fact, it's rare that I throw many monsters at my players that haven't had some kind of tweak applied to them. So today, we're gonna walk through my process for creating and tweaking monsters to give your players more interesting and unique enemies to encounter by starting up a brand new monster, the Sleeper of your core. The rules in the Dungeon Master's Guide present some guidelines on how to make a monster, but I've never found them to be particularly inspiring as they are, so I like to take a slightly different approach, which is much more story focused first and worries about the stats second. I think this results in a much more interesting and dynamic monster, which is what the players are gonna remember. They'll remember how the monster made them feel and what cool abilities it had, but not what its AC was. We start with the core concept. This is the high level idea that influences everything else we do. Throughout the rest of the process, this concept is what we'll measure our ideas against and decide whether they are right or wrong for our monster. When I'm designing monsters, I usually approach it from the point of view of creating a particular feeling in my players, usually something to complement or contrast with the wider story. For example, if the players are in a dark and spooky town, I want a monster that heightens those feelings of fear and increases the horror vibes. If you want to see how I achieve that, check out my video on running horror just up there. Or if my players are in a pristine and peaceful elven sanctuary, I might want a really violent and grotesque monster that contrasts really well to the clean aesthetic of the environment. Whatever the monster is, a really clear core idea is essential for making something more memorable. Where a monster lives and what it does outside of combat with your players is important to know because figuring these things out can really inspire you when it comes time to making stats for your monster. How much you go into the ecology of a monster will usually be dictated by how important the monster is in your session or overall story. If you're creating a one and done low level monster that the players are unlikely to spend much time fighting, then devoting a lot of time to the creature's ecology doesn't really make sense. But if you wanna create a set piece monster or something that the players will encounter multiple times, then you probably wanna spend some time thinking about what it is that this creature does outside of its interaction with the players. A good way to approach this is to think of the hierarchy of needs. The higher up the pyramid of needs you go, and the more sentient and intelligent the creature will tend to be. Figuring out what a creature consumes, what their shelter is, and how they defend themselves will go a long way to making a creature feel real, and the more of these elements that you can uncover about your creature, the more nuance you'll be able to make them. The next thing we want to think about is what kind of role does this monster fulfill in combat? Most monsters won't be facing off against the players on their own, so you want to think about what kind of battlefield role this monster fits in the broader context. Doing this will help keep you focused and you'll end up with a creature that feels much more thematic. 4th edition did an excellent job of classifying its monsters into different roles, and I like to take a similar approach when I'm homebrewing. Is my monster a soldier, a basic frontline troop who's going to be trading melee blows with a party? Or is it a support artillery monster who engages the players at range while buffing its allies? Thinking about how a monster or an enemy fits into the wider battle is going to give you a better sense of how to use them tactically in a combat and make that combat much more interesting. If you want to learn about how I run epic combats that use some of these techniques, check out this video. So once we've figured out what the core concept of the monster is, and we've decided on the battlefield role it's going to fulfill, we need to give it some stats. Now, the Dungeon Master Guide gives some guidelines on creating monster stats, but if you're new to making monsters, I find it much easier to start by reskinning an existing monster. The point here isn't just to change the name of an existing stat block and call that homebrew. Instead, we want to see what monsters already exist in the challenge range we're aiming for. I usually do this by loading up D&D Beyond, heading to the monster list, and filtering it by challenge rating, giving myself a little flexibility either side of my target CR. CR is a deeply flawed system, but by starting with a baseline of monsters that have already been created, we can keep our monsters at least internally consistent with what's already available, at least to start with. As I've said multiple times on this channel in the past, I think when you're making homebrew, the closer you can get to the official material to start with, the better the end result. Now I know I want the monster we're going to make today to be around CR 10, and the Abolith sits right in that band, so would be the perfect monster to start with as a base for abilities and attack numbers. We're not really concerned with special abilities here, but we want to just get the ballpark balance for things like ability scores, HP, attack bonuses, and save DCs. 
If you do decide you want to make a monster completely from scratch though, the rules are on page 273 of the DMG and they're going to give you an outline. But I do recommend you start with the players and then do some maths and go from there. As I've talked about in my video on the maths behind D&D, you can calculate numbers really precisely in 5e thanks to mounted accuracy. So what I like to do is look at my party stats and then balance my monster from there. Figure out what the party's average AC is and then you can calculate the hit bonus you need to give the creature to make it hit them a satisfying amount of times. For example, if we want our creature to feel really threatening, we might want them to land 70% of their attacks. If the average party AC is 16 and we give our creature a plus 8 to hit, it should be landing blows about 65% of the time, which will make it feel dangerous and like a real threat to the players. Next, you want to look at what the party's average to hit bonus is. If the party were level 9 to 10, then their average to hit bonus on their main attack is going to be around plus 8 or plus 9. They get a plus 4 from their proficiency bonus and they're likely to have a plus 4 or plus 5 modifier in their main ability. So if we want them to be hitting the creature over 60% of the time, and we do, because not hitting isn't fun, we want to give our monster an AC of around 17. Next, we want to think about damage and health. The table on page 274 of the DMG tells us how much damage we need to be outputting around for a CR10 creature, which is about 63 to 68 damage. Our monster will have multi-attack with three attacks, so we divide 63 by three for a result of 21 damage per attack. So the average damage for our monster's attacks needs to be somewhere in the region of 21. It's okay if you're a little off with these numbers because a lot of factors like reach, number of attacks, damage type, all those kinds of things are gonna come into play here, but that just gives you a reasonable starting point. For HP, the table on page 274 gives you a HP range based on CR, and the size table on page 276 tells you what hit dice to give your monster. We want our monster to be gargantuan in size, so we're going to be working with a d20. From there, we just figure out how many d20 we need, along with the constitution modifier, to end up in that HP range. Don't sweat the minute numbers too much though, as I said, CR is a deeply flawed system, and even among published monsters, there's a lot of variance, so you'll always be at the mercy of the dice gods when you get to the table anyway. Before we get to the full reveal, I wanted to let you know that the full stats and background for the Sleeper of Yukora is going to be available in May's issue of SideQuest, my new monthly RPG magazine. You'll get some background for the monster, a full stat block, the full page art for the monster, as well as a link to a token for using it in VTT play. Issue 1 of SideQuest is packed with articles of playable content for 5th edition, including an introduction to my campaign setting of Ashk, the Ranger of the Wild, which is a complete rework of the Ranger class, an article on how to save your campaign from a slow death, and more. You can get Issue 1 throughout the month of May by signing up to my Patreon below for $5, and you can get access to all the back issues at the higher tiers as well. So if you want to help support the channel and get even more content for your games, check out SideQuest in the link below. Now, back to the video. So to show these tips in action, I'm going to be making a brand new monster. A while back, I asked my Twitter followers at Icarus Games UK, you should totally come and follow me, by the way, if they had any art they wanted to see started up. And Joshua posted this gribbly beast. This is a great starting point for a challenge like this because we've got a name and some design notes to point us in the right direction. So the core concept for this beast is that it's an aberration that exists in the astral sea, the infinite void between planes of existence. I think the original concept envisioned this as an aquatic creature, but I really want the players to be able to fight this thing above ground. So I think by making it an extra planar astral beast, that's a great compromise. Now in my setting, the astral sea is dangerous. Things that spend too long there get perverted and twisted, kind of like the warp from Warhammer 40k, and traveling through the astral sea is super dangerous. So this big dude is a mix of a spider and a jellyfish, which is just nightmare fuel, but it does give us some ideas of where we can take its abilities. We are 100% going to be using the sting idea of the jellyfish, and I think we could take some inspiration from the spider to make a really horrible creature. Thinking about its ecology, we know this thing lives in the astral sea, so let's think about how it survives. It's going to need to consume to live, so we can assume, given its gargantuan size, it probably eats smaller creatures. But how does it get close to its food without scaring it off in the vast open void of the astral sea? Maybe it has some kind of camouflage or can turn invisible. Perhaps it lies in wait, camouflaged, until its prey comes close to it. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So we know this thing's patient and waits for its food to come to it, but what then? How does it get its food? 
Thinking of the jellyfish and the spider inspiration, I like the idea of it trapping its prey, stunning them in some way. Perhaps, as its signature ability, we can release some kind of EMP style blast to stun creatures in the vicinity so that it can more easily subdue them for a longer period of time to later devour them. That works well and starts to build a really strong image of this camouflaged Eukora waiting out there in the void until its food gets close and then blasting them with an EMP to stun them before it takes them off to eat them. With the core concepts in place we can start statting up this beauty. I began by using the ability scores and numbers from the Abaleth as a base. I moved the ability scores around to represent the monster I had in my head and dropped all of the Abaleth's abilities. For actions, I knew we needed multi-attack, so I gave it a choice between slam, bite, and grapple with its tentacles. I mentioned that this monster had some magic, so I gave it some spellcasting too. To work out the spell save DC, you take the proficiency bonus of the monster and add its spellcasting stat, so intelligence in this case, and add those to 8. This gets us to a DC of 16, which is right in line with the other creatures of this CR, so we're looking good so far. For spells, I gave it Shocking Grasp at will for its lightning tentacles, and then I gave it three charges of invisibility to go camouflage as it stalks its prey, and then I threw in a lightning bolt for good measure. With such a lightning focus on this monster, it made sense to give it resistance to lightning, which I added at this stage too. Then it came time to think about legendary actions. Now, legendary actions serve two big purposes, in my opinion. First, they make the monster more potent and make it feasible to run a solo monster against a group because it basically grants them another turn each round. But more importantly, this is where your big narrative concepts need to come into play. So to start with, I gave the Yukora a slam and a move action to allow it to reposition itself and do some extra damage, but then I wanted it to be able to swallow. Adding this is a legendary action that costs two actions, makes it a tactical choice that you as the DM will need to think carefully about on how to use it to swallow in combination with other attacks. Finally, I gave it the EMP Discharge, which has the chance to stun creatures until the end of the Eukora's next turn. Now, the way I would personally run this creature is before the end of its first round of combat, I would get in close to the players and drop an EMP Discharge, hopefully stunning a couple of them. Then while they're stunned until the end of its next turn, I would use that as a chance to grapple as many players as possible, up to three of them. Because they're stunned, you're going to have advantage on attacks against them, and they will automatically fail their grapple jacks, meaning you should be able to grapple at least one of them. Them. Then on the following turn, before the Eukora takes its turn, you use one of your legendary actions to swallow that player whole. I think fighting one of these creatures would be a lot of fun, thanks in no small part to the grapple and EMP mechanics. But also because having something so large be able to turn invisible and just make loads of straight attacks is kind of terrifying as a player. Finish off this beastie, I took a look at its HP and attacks and saw they were actually pretty low for a CR10 creature, especially the HP. So I used the information on page 173 of the DMG to scale up the HP and attack bonus and damage. In the end, I decided because of things like lightning resistance, its legendary actions and the slightly higher to hit bonus to stat this is a CR 11 creature but as I've said many times the CR system is far from perfect. Hopefully this video has given you a good idea of how to start making your own monsters. To recap, we need a strong concept to start with. We want to find a monster within the CR range that you're looking for to potentially reskin, or alternatively follow the guidelines in the DMG to get your basic stats. Then we want to think about the ecology of the monster and what makes it unique. Then we want to start adding cool and flavorful abilities. And then finally, we want to double check that result against the guidelines in the DMG to assign it a final CR. If you've been following the channel for a while now, you'll know that I'm a big fan of anything that reduces your mental overhead as a DM, which is why I'm really pleased that today's video is sponsored by Describe. Describe has thousands of pre-written description boxes like the ones you'd find in a published adventure to help you bring your world to life for your players. Do you need to describe the creepy castle your players are heading towards? Describe has got your back. Want to give your fireball spell a bit more pizzazz? Load up the Describe entry. Or if you want to describe some monsters, pull up the entry on Describe and get a custom description that you can use to excite or terrify your players. Many of the description boxes on Describe have been written or edited by Wizards of the Coast alumni and they're all designed to fit in with the established 5th edition style. Describe has hundreds of text boxes available for free, but you can unlock thousands more with a monthly subscription. You can even tailor your subscription depending on what kind of things that you want to describe, or you can choose an option that gives you access to everything. 
And if you use the code Icarus at checkout, you're going to get 10% off your first order, which will effectively give you a free month if you're picking up an annual subscription. Check out Describe using the link below, and thanks again to them for helping to support the channel. If you want to learn about how to take your newly made monsters and run better combats with them, check out my ultimate guide to making combat more interesting. And if you're new here, make sure to subscribe for more homebrew goodness. But until next time, happy gaming.